the spiritual approaches, when understood properly what that means, they do not just answer to the necessity of time. In fact, uh, one of the reasons for longevity of certain spiritual traditions, of certain spiritual approaches present uh, in these traditions, is precisely because they are applicable to all times, irrespective of the specifics of these times. Because the spiritual approach here is, above all else, about transcending the notion of time itself. It's about transcendence. And transcendence is what restores this rapture, this apparent rapture, apparent discourse, discord in consciousness as this reality which is raptured on the phenomenal world of forms and phenomena. And that what we experience this as a deeply intimate affair of uh, the self that experiencing it all. But it is the transcendence that brings about the possibility to answer anything that is there present as a, any apparent contradiction, any conflict, any problem that is being perceived as such at a superficial level or at a gross level or at a physical level of, of reality. So therefore, spiritual approaches here are always in accord with and in response to the necessity of time. It's just sometimes, or rather some phases in history, some times are better than others, if you will. Some times are more poignant than others. And it just seems that we live in one such time when the poignancy of this is brought to its utmost measure, simply because of this um, what we experiencing ourselves here as the separate beings, you know, lost in time and space, forgotten what is our destiny, what are we doing here, what is the real um, purpose of being alive, what is our responsibility, what is our joy, what is our happiness. You see, so th these are very simple, very direct matters. And proper spiritual approaches they reconcile this and bring back possibility for living life from that level where all this takes care by itself. Of course, it sounds a bit of a, like a magic show, but it's exactly how creation is made. It always, always responds to the necessity of time with precisely needed approach, precisely needed methodology. And you can find this in many um, ancient traditions as a traces of that myth, that sacred law, where the laws of nature, when they are in decay, bring about the rising of the waves of consciousness so as to restore this what otherwise is being endangered. And the simplicity is required. Simplicity in simply understanding that one plays a tremendous part in it. So every heartbeat goes into the repair or into the more of a despair about the situation. The active approach here is exemplified by actively giving oneself to these transformative pro processes, to giving oneself to the, that process which first begins with germination, with that getting ready. There has to be this internalization. It is required for simply certain um, 
very uh, subtle movements to subside, moving here, there, and all over the place. So that one's direction, one's life force, one's awareness, one's energies are then converted, converted inward, so that to facilitate and ensue these processes. So this is in, in itself is an active approach. It's not a passive approach. It's an active approach, but not maybe in the sense how we understand activity here. The passive approach is when we simply um, wash our hands and that we are not involved somehow. Okay, or, or there's this um, perspective that what can I do? I'm too small, I'm too puny, I'm an insignificant human being. Or um, what's the point of it all? You know, there are greater forces. I can just sit out in my own life in the corner because I, I don't count. Or what's the point in that uh, I need to, there's no point in transforming one, myself if uh, I can be helpful in going and helping someone directly by uh, helping in some of the directly perceived traumas, you see? And uh, we know a lot of really evolved beings who turn towards activism because they simply do not find enough understanding in them in terms of what it is required and what spiritual transformation is about. The best activist is the one who already transformed oneself and then actively involved in the world. He or she may be an activist per se, what that term exemplifies, or maybe very, living a very quiet life. But assisting in consciousness from the subtler levels of creation already is taking place. So we need to understand that education, essentially in our time, is such that it is materialistic. It's not consciousness-based, it is matter-based. The whole gamut of our scientism is matter-based. So that if, of course, from that perspective, all this seems to be just um, some kind of anachronism of the ages gone by. But those who do understand and then begin to experience that reality is indeed multidimensional. And they begin to feel also the effects of these experiences, the effects of these practices within themselves. Then there is less doubts and less questions in terms of what one's responsibility lays here above all else. Some questions may still be there and therefore we don't shy away from responding to such questions. But it is very, very, very important matter to sort out this once and for all. Where creation is being held and where the governing structure of this, what rules all this at the surface level of creation. If we don't have that understanding, then there will always be a shadow of a doubt that our spiritual somehow unfoldment can remedy. It will always have this sense of insecurity. Even a guilt will be mixed into that. And of course, with this, our spiritual unfoldment will be impeded. With this, the full measure of what spiritual transformation can bring will be slowed down. And we can't afford that. It's as simple as that. It's in the nature of consciousness, in the nature of our awareness. The faith here, that Sanskrit term, Shraddha, is that power 
which releases tremendous amount of otherwise stuck energy. That power of faith in our own abilities, abilities of our consciousness to affect everything around us is a tremendous power. But that power, that power of that faith also assists our transformation. And for the time being, we have to be able to build up that internal faith and every attempt which tries to dissuade us from that ideally should be recognized for what it is. And this is simply an attempt of the mind to remain in a status quo. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's now take this perspective. Yes, the world is going to end. Okay, fine. Someone insists that the world is going to end because there's no point of repair. Yeah. We reached the point beyond return. For you, for the one who sees this as manifestation of one's innermost reality, this needs to be clearly clearly understood again is that even if the world is about to end, even if this is the last day on this planet Earth, you're going to leave this world in the level of consciousness that you are. You're going to end this existence, end this embodiment, end this incarnation in exactly the same level of awareness as you are at that moment in time, because that's in the nature of consciousness itself. So therefore, strive for transcending, strive for expansion, strive for connecting to that field, strive for touching the ground of awareness, touching the ground of being, no matter what. Because it's also essentially is something that almost like people who, I can give you this very direct and simple example, people who are uh, diagnosed with terminal illnesses, very often this uh, is an opportunity for precisely that breakthrough. This very illness is the breakthrough because it creates the possibility of tremendous amount of energy being released from all these otherwise concerns which obscure this, what this life is for. And one, if one was reluctant, lazy or what have you, uninterested, unmotivated, not motivated enough, now has a visceral encounter, face-to-face -face encounter with the mortality of one's body. And the, that sudden realization is a greatest shake-up. So what's the difference? Perhaps our culture suddenly realized that it's terminally ill. It's realized in a certain way that there is this indeed something that threatens potentially extinguishing this life here. Use it as an opportunity for leap in your awareness. Use it as an opportunity to transform this pain, to transform this fear into expansion of your consciousness. Because if you jerk back and take the stand that, well, nothing makes sense, then you remove yourself from the possibility of simply exercising that what is given to you on the account of being a conscious being, being alive as a conscious being. This is what human being is, is a conscious being. Human being is the one in whom consciousness is alivened to the degree where it can have this direct experience 
direct abiding in being, as being. So, even from that perspective, even if one will take this utterly, utterly uh, dramatic, pessimistic perspective of the imminent apocalypse, even that should only add to the fervor of your transformation, rather than um, simply disarm you and to completely incapacitate you in, in your greatest gift of what this is, this gift of being able to transcend this reality. But if you don't accept this, if you don't embrace this perspective that the world is about to end as a, someone's prediction, even based on some kind of statistics, then there is essentially, you have to simply also remind yourself that whatever you experiencing is going to come to an end. One way or the other, there will be the end of you in this form, in this body. Just as when in the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna, receiving all this guidance from Krishna, wants to clarify something on the nature of these transformative practices, he is asking, so what happens to the one who hasn't reached enlightenment in this lifetime? The body it perishes before that enlightenment, so to speak. And the reply is there, a reassuring reply, that everything, everything that one has reached here is all that one is. The totality of one's being is that level of consciousness, which is at the moment of when the time of departure has come. So whatever is the next incarnation, whatever is the next body, whatever is the next life, it will be at that level of consciousness, from that level of consciousness. Whatever form you may take, it will be that consciousness. You see? So one way or the other, whatever perspective we hear, embrace or negate, one way or the other, it is your duty and it is your glory at once. Somehow this understanding that the biggest changes take place from the subtlest level of creation. That would suffice to have faith, not from the perspective of, uh, not from that religiously colored um, attitude of a believer, but more like a sound conviction that one's consciousness, one's field of awareness is not separate from that what all this creation springs forth from. Therefore, one's consciousness, when it expands, when it vibrates at a much finer level, can bring about not just some positive vibrations into the environment, but can, it can actually and factually assist often radical changes that are required in uh, terms of this very, very poignant moments in time um, when there is this shift in paradigm and when there is a necessity to transit from one platform of understanding, from one ideology, from one perspective on life to that which supports all life so that no aspects, no parts of culture in conflict with each other, 
but are expressive potentiality of that culture where they coexist in harmony with themselves, with the environment and with the whole world. So this of course cannot come just from the level of a wishful thinking, it cannot come from the level of trying to imagine, trying to be mindful, to um, find the solutions on the level of how to change the culture, because that change will come only from the superficial level of the gross level of expression already. Because mind, it's only that conscious level of thinking. It can only think and utilize what is available to that conscious level of the mind. But if we are not taking into account that there are other levels where the mind itself finds its provenance, where the mind itself find its, finds its strength and inspiration, then unless that mind expands into this much finer dimensions of reality, then these possibilities will not be presented. Therefore, the attitude of a spiritual aspirant, the attitude of a spiritual being, should be steeped in this understanding, which starts, begins from the get-going, that his or her awareness, his or her consciousness, is inseparable from the consciousness of all, from the consciousness per se, from that which knows no other, from that unified field. When that understanding is there, then awakening, of course, it's not just existential affair to go beyond one's own limitations. It's just half the picture, maybe even less than half the picture. It's just a certain deeply intimate perspective. But awakening then presents a factual opportunity, a possibility, where that otherwise awareness, individualized awareness, that is what the average human being um, has, can expand to the dimension of other dimensional realities which encompass all different and subtlest level and subtlest strat of creation. From that level, that individual is not only can think from a qualitatively different level, but above all else can intuit reality from a very different level. Intuiting reality from a different level, that being or the consciousness of that being can begin to bring changes into this level of reality, not in terms of moving something from one place to another, not in terms of creating this possibility of, okay, this procedure didn't work, we'll replace it with that procedure. It, will, it can come up with something which is not even in the language and not even in the capacity of the given culture of how to deal with certain predicament, with certain problem, because the solution can only come from a place when there is more consciousness. And we cannot stop just there. And of course, this will be um, giving it um, a high shot, but we should not discard that possibility because it is always present, it is always here as a given, that when, a, when the individual consciousness can expand to its fullest potential as that what is exemplified by that unified field, then the consciousness of that individual, who is no longer simply individual, it, experiences are there very much of the experiences of the individual, obviously, but the consciousness of that being vibrates at such frequency that it begins to bring this otherwise dormant laws of nature to the level of manifestation. So the fabric where it is teared begins to be repaired 
not at the visible, not at the gross level of creation. It begins to be repaired at a subtle strata of creation. When that happens, then as reality vibrates, everything is a field of vibration, everything is this ocean of sound, and the gross manifest level of creation is simply known as different degrees in sound condensed, so different degrees of sound condensed as matter, yes. So this matter can also be seen as simply, simply uh, degrees of these sounds, degrees of that. If that is true to the uh, material world, perceptible through the senses, how much more so in terms of one's feelings and thinking, in terms of one's um, emotionality and in terms of one's uh, essentially powers of intuition. So therefore, this process, what awakening is, exemplifies, simply repairs, as it were, or upholds, or brings to greater balance what is currently being out of balance. And I'm not even speaking now from that ultimate perspective of that there is no world out there outside of our perception. Because some, um, some of you who may uh, be watching this, listening to this, may not understand that concept may not understand that the world out there simply doesn't exist outside of our perception. That the perceiver, the observer and the observed are unified. It's different modalities of one awareness. So there is no such thing as objective experience out there, or objective reality outside of our subject which experiencing it. So supposedly, we have this understanding that uh, our being here uh, obviously is an affair in consciousness, but our being here, this uh, phase of human being, is just uh, was kind of some a phase, a transition, perhaps uh, a trial and error in consciousness. Yeah, I hear you, and I've heard about these perspectives before. It is being spoken out loud that we're here, it didn't work, so it's no big from the bigger perspective, and it's time for us to go. We simply failed. Not that we are failed, obviously, because the question already states that it's, this is an experiment in consciousness. So, if the question comes from that understanding, that what I would invite you to examine here is a simple contradiction, is that if we are indeed an experiment in consciousness, then it means that that what is an experiment itself is, insepar is inseparable from our own awareness, from our own consciousness. That e experiment here uh, will otherwise, this whole notion of the experiment, will turn us into some kind of um, I don't know, biological robots, some kind of humanoids who simply here uh, to prove their longevity or to prove their in incapacity to be, to be in sync with the rest of creation, given this whole possibility of uh, sensing, thinking, creating, interacting, relating, evolving and so forth. This perspective can be easily um, debunked because whatever is happening in consciousness, we are not separate from, separ separate from it. So we can see that the whole creation is an experiment in consciousness. What is one's attitude would be to that? One way or the, the other, that um, kind of stand or stands that if human affair of being alive here in this moment in time is um, some kind of uh, transitory phase in terms of what consciousness came up with, then first of all, 
uh, Zlatan itself should free one from any worries and concerns because one's consciousness is indestructible. So whatever form it will take, your consciousness is there. It's inscrutable, it's indestructible, it's imperishable. So whatever form, whatever form it will take, whatever life, we call it human today, tomorrow we might call it something else. But question of course comes from a very human perspective. That's what makes it into a question. It comes from a very human, humanistic even perspective. So what if we are this experiment? So what of us? What do we do? So then again, we have that choice. We have that choice to continue that, even if that is an experiment, and see how far we can go with it. So if we are to take that stand, that we are indeed an experiment in consciousness, we are, we are indeed this phase in evolution. What do we do about that? Do we take it from the perspective of um, there's nothing for us to do here, that um, our part is simply to be the puppets and not to um, even bring into the actualization uh, that um, hidden dimension of what we are at the most refined level of our beingness here. So yes, okay, fine, we are this, we are this experiment in consciousness. Let's take that stand, let's take that view. Do we know where the experiment began? Do we know where this experiment ends? Why should we take the fact that there is this um, a catastrophic picture that is being painted by some of our um, earthlings or some of our brothers and sisters that this is essentially somehow the end of reality as we know it or the end of our reality as we know it, the end of this phase in civilization. What if this is one of those boiling moments in the experiment? What if this is a critical mass, what is this, what if this is indeed where the shift in consciousness takes place? Not shift in just uh, public awareness that, oh yes, we need to do something. Oh, okay, it's too late to do something. It's the same perspectives, can't you see? Just recognize this to be the same perspective. The, the actual nihilism, if we truly look into that, is already loomingly presenting itself in that perspective that this is the end of the world. How many of these people have ever entertained possibility for another, another scenario? How many of these beings who paint this very gloomy picture even understand the basis behind this creation? How many? Do we have that picture? Do we have that understanding? Do we have these facts? We don't. And we cannot essentially place this very, very intimate relationship we have into the hands of those who present us with this picture. It has to be our own picture that we paint for ourselves. You have to be as a spiritual aspirant an independent thinker. If you don't become an independent thinker, then you will be thrown here and there, hither and thither in terms of the perspectives. And that, of course, will not assist anything. It will not assist any process. You will be simply thrown around with different perspectives. First, you have to get that there has to be independence in your stand. Then even if you are an experiment in consciousness, you have to go all the way in that experiment. You have to have the courage of your own conviction. And when your awareness, when your individual field is affected by the downright negative perspectives, and these negative perspectives, this um, domineering factor of uh, life lived in fear, has been with us for quite some times. 
there is constantly this something that we essentially um, confront it with. And that what we are confronted with is these deep existential fears that then brought to the surface level of affairs with that eminence, eminent possibility of apocalypse, of the end of, of it all. So in other words, this ultimate fear is being exercised. This ultimate fear is being then the reason not to commit yourself to that, but can uphold this at the tipping point of it all. So one of the responsibilities of the spiritually oriented, spiritually minded being is to be free, independent thinker. So that one is no longer swayed by what others are saying, presenting facts and so forth. One has to be unmovable, unshakable in the understanding that one's consciousness is not separate from the universal consciousness. And if one can enliven these laws in oneself, if one can enliven that field in oneself, that one automatically enlivens the field in the others. One automatically enlivens the field in the entire of creation. It's not just assisting in this, what happens on this planet. The entire universe, the entire solar system, the entire universe is being impacted. But it is very difficult to comprehend at the superficial level of thinking. A quantum understanding is required here. Quantum understanding. Not the understanding based on Newtonian physics. We left New the understanding of Newtonian physics a long time behind. But most of us still live by them in terms of their ideology, even, even if they use equipment which is way supersedes and exceeds the possibilities that Newtonian physics talked about. We forget that. So, really, this experiment in consciousness um, is exactly what every spiritual, sincere, aspirant embarks on precisely that experiment so that one can enliven that field within one's own awareness. One becomes this researcher into the realm of one's own consciousness. One becomes the scientist of consciousness. One's, one becomes the investigator into the realm of consciousness, where one can bring the possibilities that are there in a dormant state of pure potentiality into this field of manifested creation. And then the miracles are only, only a matter of language. It's the perspective. You want to call it a miracle? I call it simply the result of the impact of the subtler on the gross then these possibilities of ecological disaster essentially can be all, all perfectly equilibrate itself and balance itself. Just where we started earlier, immeasurable is the power of nature to purify itself, is to restore the balance. But if we look at it only from this uh, level of facts and the data, collectible data, then we undermine the nature and only consider the nature at the superficial level only. So already there is a massive rupture in, even in these scientific investigations. What science are we talking about? It's all fragmented. People who collect data and not necessarily even scientists per se. On the other hand, we have scientists in, who, deal, who deal with the uh, domain of consciousness, who deal with the, uh, with the quantum perspective of this creation. What do they have to say about this? You see? So even here, we need to understand that 
the stand that the spiritual practitioner takes is paramount to the way his or her evolution will unfold. If at the threshold of your own evolution you are a direct and visceral possibility for a breakthrough, you, became, you then suddenly pulled back by this, now I would like to say directly, quite negative perspective, limiting negative and very narrow perspective, then you undermine that visceral possibility for a quantum leap. You undermine that possibility for a breakthrough that can take place in you. And that breakthrough that can take place in you, in another, in myself, in all of us, those who gave themselves to these practices, they are holding that newly awakened consciousness at the tipping point of their awareness. And that tipping point here is what is needed so that the equilibrium is restored. Nature then quite naturally performs everything what needs to be done. And all the ozone layers will be restored and all the aquatic waters will be purified. Not purified by some magical being in the clouds or by some kind of uh, abstract notion of the divine. It will be purified from that subtlest level, from the most foundational level of creation. But many people, when they give themselves to these practices, they evolve, expand to a certain degree, and then they often being pulled into this argument, into this essentially argument which is there, just diverts the precious life force from the real transformation into the field of some argumentation. And forgive me, very often that in itself is simply based in that righteousness of perspective. Many of these argu arguments are simply indispensable from spiritual approaches, if they are rooted in truly transformative practices, transformative, trans transformative practices which uh, viscerally, factually transform the psyche, the consciousness of a being, that that being can directly get in touch with the field of being and live from that being, then all there is what, what needs be done. All there is that what is required 